so I thought tonight we could do something different. I thought we could uh, learn and grow in preaching. And I'm not talking about just getting up here and doing before. I'm going to, I want us to learn how to preach. There's a difference between teaching and preaching. The Bible teaches this. Look at, uh, look at, uh, well, before we do that, I want to go to uh, 1 Peter 1. I did something on Sunday, and I'm going to do it every Sunday, but I think I might even do it on midweeks because uh, we're human beings, and when we come into church uh, together, um, I love the zeal tonight, by the way. Yeah. You guys are screaming and talking. At first, I was an old guy going, gosh, darn it, that's irritating. And I go, you know what? It's better than them all coming in and sitting and being quiet. <laughs> so, I, so you guys are having fun and talking smack like you're on a sports team. And hopefully the older, mature men understand that's a good thing. They're not out doing crack and killing people. But uh, I, I want to say, uh, uh, I, I want us to always think about why we come together. And I know it's because we, we, we are walking with God. But look in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. I want us to have this memorized. I've asked before, but I really want you to incorporate this, not just because I'm asking you to memorize it. I want you to incorporate it in your quiet time every morning and recite it in your prayer, because if you do that, it's going to deepen your faith and your, and your real belief on God who you cannot see, but is real. So let's say it together. Ready? And I want you to put it, you know what I mean when you, when you put it in first person? Though I have not seen him, I love him. And even though I've not seen him now, I believe in him and I am filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for I'm receiving the end result of my faith, the salvation of my souls. Now you think about that. Man can't write that. If you don't believe in the supernatural afterlife with God, this, you know, this is ridiculous to people. But to us who are being saved, it's the message of the cross, the power, right? Think about that. It's such a beautiful thing. Peter recites this in 65 AD, carried by the Spirit. And the only other times we see, we, we, we read about Peter or even Peter having dialogue is about 30 some odd years earlier. So he's an older man. So in between the Acts and the Gospels, when Jesus was with them, rebuking him and saying, get behind me, Satan, and you know, and really calling him out, but he was training him. We see there's a huge window in Acts where we see them evangelizing the world, but then we realize here he comes to write this as an older man, and he's not lost any of his faith, but only grown. And Jesus has been away in the person for 30 plus years as well, like just like with us, he doesn't see him. But when you read that, that should do something to you because inexpress we're filled with inexpressible and glorious joy if you include that in your quiet time it will challenge you it will challenge your faith it will expose you it will encourage you it will inspire you it may stop you in your tracks and go i got to get with somebody because i definitely cannot honestly say i am filled with inexpressible and glorious joy so then you got to be honest not just run through it like your religious scripture because if you can't be filled with inexpressible and glorious joy or get back there. I'm not saying, but, but I'm saying you should not stay away from that. This is a normal one-on-one Christian, because there's only such thing as one-on-one Christian. You grow in the Lord, but when you're saved, you need to be filled with inexpressible and glorious joy, and you should be able to re-bring that back regardless of outside circumstances. That's why we preach. You guys believe that? Yeah. So I want you to be challenging yourself. On during the week when you get into a bad attitude or a down thing either you need to repent you're in sin get open and you need to, and, and, and you need to figure out dig down deep with you and God and maybe get a brother and talk I'm not feeling it why not and figure it out and ask God to help you get back to here because this isn't just for super Christians he is saying exactly because if you're saved and you're a disciple and you study the Bible and you, you, you put your faith in the blood of Christ and you understand why you did what you did and who Jesus is, then you know you love him and you believe in him and you're filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. Why? Because Jesus died for you. You're, fi you're receiving the end, of your, end result of your faith. You don't wait till you get to be an old man and go, okay, now death is getting closer. Now I need to get excited. You need to be excited now as a young person because you're dying. 
So I really mean that. I want us to be a church that shows the fruit of the Spirit with everybody. Be and the only way you guys can do that is you have to go to God on your knees. I can't, I can't rah-rah you into the kingdom. But if we want to be genuine before God and each other and the world, not trying to act like we're something when they're not, you're weak, you share your weak. You sin, you share your sin. You stay humble, but you never quit and you're always willing to get back. People like honesty and vulnerability. It's not in the world that much. So let's really go there, okay? And let's get there. And let's stay there. So no sad sacking allowed for a long period of time. You got to repent. Discouragement, challenges can come. We need to be compassionate and patient, draw people out. But we got to understand, God says you shouldn't be able to be staying away from inexpressible and glorious joy for too long. Unless you don't believe you're saved. Then I'd be very concerned and figure out what's wrong. Amen? So let's look at... Um, let's look at... Uh, Second Timothy four, and I was really encouraged. You know, Pablo, uh, I've really uh, worked hard since I met him uh, coming in to. Uh, and what's really interesting is we did seeking God today with Pablo, and uh, we read in Acts um, seventeen twenty five where it says God determines the exact places and times where we should live. God did this so that perhaps so that man might perhaps seek Him and find Him, though He's not far from any of us, or perhaps not. And we all start sharing about where I, I share, always share, like I even when I go to L.A., sometimes I'll drive by the house where I would start studying the Bible in 93 because I realized later on how profound that scripture was. I was living in that time when someone invited me. I came, started studying the Bible. That was a, that was a God moment. Yeah. And uh, Blondell shared how he found the church on the website. And then Pablo wasn't even coming to the audition that we had at Full Sail. We had an open audition for the, the film uh, How, uh, Castle of Glass, and he wasn't even coming. He went to another audition because we were in full sale in the casting area, and Devon walked out, and he was walking by Devon and leaving, and he looked back, and, and he went over to and he told me this. We were, I said, this is you, bro. This isn't a coincidence. You're sitting here with us. This isn't a coincidence. We're not better, but we're disciples showing you the truth. And he goes, yeah, I went back, and I went, I said, what's going on over here? And Devon said, come on in, you want to audition? And he came in. If he didn't stop and do that, he wasn't even coming for that. And now he's in the film, but that's not God's point. God didn't want, God just got him in the deal so he can find the truth, and he wants to seek God. That should blow your minds. But I invite him to everything. And today he said, because sometimes when you invite people to everything and they keep turning you down nicely, but they say, I can't make it. You can in your mind sometimes think, oh, they're not into it. But I just, I decided I keep inviting people until they tell me to go, don't ever call me again, or I'm not into it. I don't want to come. Then I still may call them in a month <laughs> because I, I'm not doing anything wrong. But he told me today, he goes, thanks for not giving up on me. I know I had, I had to, can't, I had to, I couldn't come to all these things. You're inviting me. I said, I really appreciate you asking me to come. I go, wow, that was awesome. God, let me hear that because people want to know the truth. So here's why we preach. Because there shouldn't be anything more exciting than this. Let's look in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Other exciting news uh, I, I was going to share is that uh, tomorrow um, I went over to the brother's house before Thanksgiving. Uh, Wednesday night. I went over to your guys. Was it Wednesday night? Yeah. Wednesday night. And I wanted to say goodbye. Was it Wednesday night or was it Tuesday night? Tuesday night. Tuesday night. I went over. I just want to say goodbye to some of the brothers if they're there. And I just popped in and they're playing games. But they had a guy named Joe and, and Pat. Pat uh, Prad, Pradrick, Pratik, Pratik, Pratik was there, and I just got, was sitting there, and I never know those guys, I started getting to know him, and that Pratik guy started talking to me, and he went to Ohio, and he was going to come back, but he was talking about the Bible, and I guess Joe had went to church, and he's talking, and he just started asking me questions, and he was playing chess with uh, Bryce when I came in, so he's, these guys, appreciate you guys already having guys in your house, you're just hanging out, playing games, playing chess, these are visitors, this, they're seeing you as real people, but then he just started talking to me, and I started talking back, and we started getting into it. I took his number down. I called him. I texted him uh, yesterday, and he said, yeah, tomorrow. I'm, first, he hit me back and said, I'd love to get together after finals. And I was like, look at the text going, that's like a week and a half. And I go, because texting is interesting, right? So I said, um, perhaps I could come meet you if you have an hour in between class at school. See, instead of just waiting and going, I can't get you, I realized he, I don't think he meant that. I think he just realized, oh, I said, hey, can I come and meet you? I didn't, I thought he went to Valencia. And he goes, oh yeah, after 2.45 on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Wednesdays, I'm free. And I go, what? So then I, so, so what I'm trying to say is you be persistent. 
And then I said, okay, so the bottom line is tomorrow David's going with me. Him and I are going over to Seminole State, which is about 10 miles away. Uh, it's, a, it's a college. And he says, I, me and some friends might be there. So either we're going to go in and do a study or we're going to go in and do an impromptu Bible talk. Yeah. Either way, I'm excited. I hope you're excited. If I get a group, one, two, or a hundred people that want to have a chance to hear something, I am so excited and filled with inexpressible glorious joy. Because now I have to use, I get to use my faith to hopefully help others understand what the inexpressible and glorious joy is. Do you feel that way? That's another question you have to ask for yourself, because if God wants all people to be saved and come to all his truth, then we should want all people to be saved because that's what God desires, right? Yeah. So you got to answer your own questions and go, and then once again, take it to prayer and go, I don't really feel that way. Tell God that, then look at the scriptures and go, I need to not feel that way. And then you ask God to help love and help to think and help to remember and help to care about strangers. And you ask him every day, you'll start caring about strangers because he doesn't expect you to think. He, he knows you're no good. I mean, he knows you and I can't like strangers naturally. We may, you know, extend ourselves, but we're not just naturally going to be willing to get into a vivacious conversation about something we don't care about because we want to hopefully have a door to help a person be saved. It takes energy. That's love. Okay, guys? So I want you to understand that there's moments of opportunity that I think we're missing still. And I want you guys to pray for that. And now I also have a, a couple that we met around the block, another couple that's coming over Thursday. And I got the Wilsons pulled in and he's a computer programmer and he was in the military. And I start talking to the guy and Sonia was over there and they had chairs they were giving it away. And Sonia goes, you giving those away? Because she always takes walks around and we get all our furniture from all the neighbors. <laughs> we do. Most of, but they go, yeah, and we couldn't fit them in the car. So they walk the chairs over with Sonia to that, my house. And then she brings them in and I meet them and we start talking. And, and then we drove them back to their place because they walked all the way around the block with all the chairs. And, and he starts talking to me and he starts going, I am really working on being an extrovert just out of the blue. After we're already talking, what do you do? What are you doing? I said, that's incredible. Because he, he just got humble. He'd been in the military. And he said that uh, I actually read out loud with my wife. And sometimes I even read, like, if it's, a, if it's a part of a character in a book, I'll actually become that character. And it's really ironic how I feel more uninhibited. I go, bro, I have an actor's workshop I do once in a while. I help people in confidence and improv and stuff like that. It's funny. And we start talking. So he's coming over Thursday knowing that I'm a minister. We're going to do a Bible. Look at the Bible. But we're also going to do a little improv. Uh, bravery, getting out of ourself, uh, impromptu stuff, and he knows that's already coming. So now that's a fun night for them. There are a couple that's probably been going home from work every day looking at the TV. They're looking for something to do. What I'm trying to say, guys, is you never know if you're open and praying. You never know if one little conversation can open a barn. And that's what I want you to understand, not because I'm telling you, because God wants us to blow out Orlando and save as many as possible as quickly as possible. So you don't feel discouraged. You just have to have it on your heart to go, God, help me. You could even say, lead me to some soul today. Please, I want to be used. If you do that every day, you watch how you'll be having conversations without even realizing it. Second Timothy 4.1. So I'm fired up. Because I'm really fired up on this meaningless earth when I got some, because I'm already saved, right? I stay saved. After that, what do I do? I kill time till I find another unsold, unsaved soul that wants to listen. Because that's really all I care about is being with people that want to hear the truth that maybe aren't saved. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm just killing time. What's on, you know, work out, hang out, you know. What else is there really to do? I don't need that much food. I actually still haven't learned that I, I'm still eating more than I really need. I probably could live on $2 a day. Come on, Bob, thanks for bringing those cookies, you nightmare. <laughs> All right, so now, let's look at this scripture. Ready? I want you to really listen to it. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine instead to suit their own desires they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths but you keep your head in all situations endure hardship do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all your duties of your ministry. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. 
We're all in the depart departure lounge, really. And, and then he says, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness with the Lord. The righteous judge will reward me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Those would be the people who are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy because they're receiving the goal of their faith, the salvation of their souls, and they're excited. Uh, and then he says here, uh, the righteous judge will warn me. And he says, the Lord, uh, and then, then he goes on after uh, he says, uh, long for his peering. And then he says, then he switches gears. 14, Alexander, the metal worker, just another dude that was made into a disciple that, that now fell away. The metal worker did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he's done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to my, sword, my, my support, but everyone deserted me. See, cowardness is huge. Being afraid of being rejected is huge in our society, especially taking a stance against other people if they're wrong with God. Everybody deserted him. May it not be held against him. Paul's not shy. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength. There's the walk with God. The Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fu fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory to the Father forever and ever. Amen. You notice how Paul switches first person? He's preaching the letter. He wrote the letter to the church in Ephesus. I mean, in, uh, he, he wrote the church to uh, uh, Timothy for instruction, but it was passed around all the churches. But he switches gears and talks about what's going on to him, and he talks about the truth broadly that the presence of God's going to come. We, we are in, the, like verse 1, in the presence of God. Now, does that just mean God happened to be around 2,000 years ago and those people are going, yes, or does that work for us right now when I just said that? Are we in the presence of God, not just in this building, but everywhere you go? Yes, right. See, if you don't connect that with faith, God sees and is in presence, but you're not connected and you can only please God with faith. So you should learn to have a subconscious awareness of God 24-7, and you need to renew your mind to train to be aware of God. It's a mental training issue with faith. A subconscious awareness of the presence of God. If you're at work, school, test, you don't have to be saying anything, but you just know he's there. Yes. That helps you be filled with inexpressible and glorious joy, even when you're struggling with a momentary test that won't go to heaven or your job, or your wife, or your kids, or whatever's going on that needs to be paid attention to and cared for and, you know, do your best, but God is bigger. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? How many of you got that down? I had to really work on that, to, to, to really have a present, a, a, a subconscious awareness of God's presence, and I can't say I do it 24 hours a day, but I'm way better at it. You know what? Number one, it keeps you clear and strong and, and more ready to, to, to see temptation. And stop it. You stay out of that, that vacuum of getting sucked back in the world. You're aware of things. You switch gears quicker. You can handle situations without being unrelatable, but you know I'm not going to get too close to fire and I will not get burnt. Do you believe that in the presence of him? So here we see the battle, and then you see once again down there he's talking about that, but then he goes in verse 8, watch this interesting thing, and this shows a powerful personal relationship with God, which we all should have. Now there is in store for me... Now he's just, but he's not, it's not like, it's not just him, but he, he can only talk for him. So is it, I, I can say my God saved me from that. I can be in front of all you guys and go, my God, you guys want to say, it's my God too. I, well, I hope, but I can't speak for you. It's my God or it's our father. You know, I can assume, but when I'm alone or it's a, I can only draw on what I'm at. And if I'm clear and transparent and on my knees with God, then God, you are my God. And he says here. I've, he says, uh, you, excuse me, he says, for I, in verse six, look at six, says, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering and the time for my departure is near. He's got a premonition from God that he's going to die. And he did, he did die. Theory, the, the history tells us not, not far after this, he was already in prison. He was marched out and his head was cut off. 
he goes, the time is near for my departure. And he, and he even renounces. And God gave him the premonition because he used men to write the word. So we're reading this to be inspired. And I don't know about you, but these next three verses are the most inspiring verses you can think. This guy's in his deathbed. He's ready to be executed. He gave his whole life up and he's fired up. And look what he says. I've fought the good fight. Not we, I, because you're going to stand before God, not us. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. That takes time on your own. The church won't be able to keep your faith. You contribute and serve God's church as you come already faith-filled, walking with God personally. And then he says, now there's in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. There you, if you have a subconscious awareness of God, you're, you're, you're realizing that this life is meaningless compared to life to come. You're doing your duties and whatnot, but everything's a platform. If the shiny stuff is too shiny on earth to you, you need to get more spiritual. We need things, but don't get the shiny, don't let the shiny things on this earth start attracting you more than God Almighty's treasure. Amen? Amen? So let's preach tonight. So what's the word preach mean? You're excited. You have fervor. It's not just something, oh yeah, by the way, I passed by the hardware store and I got 20 cents off two light bulbs. You should go there. That, that's not very, you know, amen. But when you're preaching, they know that you believe it. You're fired up about it, and you're so fired up about it that you, you can't contain yourself to tell people. That's what that means. It doesn't mean yelling, necessarily. It means conviction. Mm -hmm. And that's where I want to see if we know where we're at. So what I'd like to do is, let's see, why don't we have one of you guys come up here? Who wants to come up and do, and who wants to come up and preach uh, the first, in verse, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1? through two, and then add your own, reiterate what you just said with your own words, with emphasis. I already did it for you, but all you got to do is re-say it. Now, are you excited that you're in the presence of God and you're going to be judged? Are you excited you're going to be judged? If you're walking in the light, you are so excited. If you're afraid, then maybe you still love sin too much. Because I revere God, but if you're walking in the light, the blood of Jesus, you have no fear because it's the blood of Jesus. You're not hiding sin. You're not just take, you're taking God serious, right? So we all will face judgment. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you're not going to stand before God and be proven tested. You don't just go through, you're saved. You know, at baptism, your sins are forgiven by faith, but you've got to walk the talk and prove genuine to the end. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So, but you should be excited because the only, the only failure is a, is a lack of willingness to get back up, a lack of willingness to say, I'm sorry, the lack of willingness to go your way, God, not my way. Right? So, why don't we have David come on up here? So come up. You can use mine, you can, you can look at mine because it's big. So I'm gonna, you, I can, you can look at mine because it's big. I want you to preach, the, uh, preach uh, I want you to read verse one and two, and then reiterate what that tells you to these people in okay. your own words. Like just, you know, don't go on, but just preach it. But I want you to read. And by the way, if you're going to be a Christian, you need to read good. True, true. Back in the first century, you didn't need to read because they didn't teach reading. Now you need to learn to read. Why? Because we're teaching the Bible. So when you're reading the Bible and studying, and I'm not trying to put you down, everybody has to do, you have to practice reading out loud. So when you read with someone in the study, you can't be stuttering and being not inspiring. You got to go, Blah, blah, you gotta have, you gotta have, you gotta have, and you can't just be reading it because you're tired. You gotta be going, and so, so the guy, you're, you should be excited about the Word of God. If you talk, if you, if you, if you read the Word of God boring, you're in sin. I don't know if it says that, but I think it is, because you're not, you're not passionate. Why wouldn't you be passionate? Go ahead. All right, just said one and two, right? Yeah, one and two. Read it like you mean it, and then share what it means to you, and then, you know, challenge your brother. Right? Okay, so it's is 2 Timothy 4, 1, uh, 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 2. And it says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. What I'm getting from this is the fact that God is bigger than everything. You know what I mean? Like, there's nothing that I can put above God like all my problems, no matter how big, and just looking at how 
an example for me is this year, literally, how God has just been alive for me. You know what I mean? But he says that who is living and who's going to judge the living and the dead. So I'm just looking at how he's helped me even now, but he's powerful enough to judge even those who have died. You know what I mean? So I'm like, I must do the best that I can while I'm alive. Right? But then like, on top of that, he says, in view of his appearing, that means it's a goal that we should have. We should continue to see that there's a direction that we should be looking at. You know what I mean? His kingdom is already here, but we're still working because once saved, not always saved. You know what I mean? So we should stay in the fight. You know what I mean? And having that goal focus, saying that I'm saved now, but I have to continue looking at the kingdom, seeking it and making sure that when it appears, his time when he does come, you know what I mean? It's going to come. And before that, he's given us a charge. You know what I mean? He's saying, preach the word. So not just learn, you know what I mean? Don't, don't be deceived, as I can't remember which scripture that was. Don't deceive yourselves to just hear and walk away, but, you know, act on the word, you know what I mean? So, and that's by preaching it, and that's going to share what you have learned, how, you have, how God has changed your life, and my life especially, and how I can share that with others to inspire others. But also it says, be prepared in season and out of season, which means at no time should you never be prepared. That's good. You know what I mean? At all times, is an opportunity for you to share your faith, and always just be vigilant and be alert because you never know who's looking and who's seeking to be saved. You know what I mean? And then it says correct, rebuke, and encourage. That stands for us, even as brothers. You know what I mean? Like, don't just be sleeping and you never know what your brother... Because, like, a question I always ask myself is, do I know what my brother is struggling with right next to me? Because I'm thinking about going to save his soul out there, but how is my brother doing right next to me? You know what I mean? So I, I must be able to not only correct and rebuke, but also encourage my brothers. You know what I mean? To even correct myself, you know, rebuke myself, and also be open enough to, for, for people to see how I'm doing so I can also be corrected and be rebuked and encouraged. You know what I mean? And it says with great patience and careful instruction. This right here is very important because, first of all, we should be able to listen. Because it's always important, like, when, you're, when your brother is talking to you and being open up, to you, like, don't just hear what he's saying. Understand what he's trying to say. You know what I mean? Understand where the root is of that confession, of that, or that struggle is. So you cannot only focus on the root of that cause, but also encourage him and meet him where he is so you can lift him up. You know what I mean? And with careful instruction, that means not, oh, don't just speak randomly, saying, oh, yeah, I heard this, I heard this, I heard this. But be confident in the word that you're speaking. You know, because you study it out throughout and let that, the, God, the, the word of God, be what you use to help encourage others and correct and rebuke them. And that's what I get awesome. from this. Awesome. Good job, bro. Good job. You know, he opened up the scripture for me. He says, in view of his appearing. I, 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 I understand what that was, but when he opened that up, it almost it, it, it connects right with what Peter was saying. You're filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy because you're receiving the goal of your faith. So I'm sure, in view of his appearing, keep your eye on the prize. Keep your eye on the, on the big term goal, the overall goal. Don't get taken out by little distractions that are important. We live on this earth. We need to go after life. We need to carry our load, but don't get so consumed up. That's why he says, seek for his kingdom. Because if you don't seek for his kingdom, you're going to get derailed from keeping the view of why you're really living. What is the big term goal? You know you're going to die. The greatest goal is to stay saved and die saved. Die strongly saved in the Lord, fired up. When you're on your deathbed, your relatives are looking sad and confused. You're like, it's great. I'm, I, I want, and any of them that aren't disciples, you go, you need to study the Bible. If you want to care about grandpa, study the Bible. Because I'm fine. I'm going with God. I did it. I'm, I'm going to die, and I'm going to miss you. But I don't want to miss you forever. That's what you say when you're dying saved. You're fired up. You're not all, they're all out. Their relatives are like, because no one knows what to do. No one knows the answers. That's what you say. You give the answers. When you're dying, you have a great opportunity to scare the tar out of people by being excited. Because I'm going to heaven. Let me show you. See? So view is appearing. Careful instruction. Great job. Okay. Uh, how about... Uh... All right, Stephen, come on up here. Okay, now... Um, I want you to turn to... Yeah, we're going to change it. Uh, let, let's go to... Uh, Go, go to Romans chapter 12, verse 9. No, it's fine, bro, because you know what? Don't listen. I want to, I want to, I'm not, there's no setup here. This is what I want you to understand. 
I don't expect, this is a gym right now, it's a spiritual gym at midweek, guys. We're Christians, we're growing, we're strengthening and exercising our Christianity and faith, right? So I'm not trying to put him on the spot, but what I want to even let you know that you have the mind of Christ. You have the Holy Spirit indwelling in you at baptism. So, but we have to be able to, to, to have enough faith to not get scared in the moment of fear. And you got to grow through that. If you read it and just focus on it, not thinking what I got to look like, you'll have something to say. Don't worry about anything else, but go, God will move you to say this. So I want you to read Romans 12. I want you to just read verse 9 and 10. And, 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 and I want you to read it loud and preach it. And then... I want you to preach to these brothers. So, David, what I want to say, you did everything great, and I appreciate you being humble. You want to be humble. But I, I want to remind you, when you're preaching, you can qualify yourself. But we say in view, uh, in, in view of God's, in the, in, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, in view of appearing, after you come back and say, do you understand you're in the presence of God? Are you ready for Christ to come back? Are you ready? That, now you're putting people in a question mark. You're calling people out. You go, you know what? I need to search my heart every day. Are you really ready? That, that gets people to go, oh, that's fine. Because you're just asking a question from the scriptures, okay? So you want to do that to people too, but then yourself. <laughs> 9 and 10. Romans 12, 9 and 10. Come on. Good afternoon, brothers. So in uh, Romans uh, 12, verse 9 through 10, it says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. And I read this, and it says, Love must be sin sin sincere. And um, how do we show sincere love to each other? And uh, I know for me, just being around people in my job and things like that, I show the love that you guys give me. It basically transfers into them. Yeah, you know I mean, and people come to me and um, just customers, I help them out. Like I hold the door for somebody, things like that. And be like, they'll, they'll see that sincere love. So um, I just tell you brothers, is God's love emanating on other people? And it says, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Um, I know for me, Anytime that, oh, I go into sin or, you know, I think about sinning, it, it's like for me, it's like a, uh, it's like, oh, I did something wrong. But if for, for me, I really need to change that mindset into hating it and going, in, going, um, going to God when I go into these ways. And it says, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourself. So when I read this, it says, be good to one be devoted to one another. Be devoted to one another in love. So basically, how are we loving one another? How are we devoting ourselves as a sacrifice, a living sacrifice? I know that um, Jesus, when he, when he was with his, his disciples, uh, the, the, he, he devoted himself to them. Not just, not just to his preaching, but his people he was with. He devoted himself to them. They, they, they show, he showed that sincere love that we can, that we can imitate. And in closing, it says, honor one another above yourselves. And I, I really feel, do feel like that Jesus was the one that honored one another above himself. Like he, he washed his disciples' feet. You know, he died for our sins. You know, so if Jesus can do that for us, you know, what can we, what little things can we do for one another? So um, uh, as I close today, guys, I just uh, really like to urge with you guys to actually show the love that Jesus showed us, yeah. but not just with us, but the people that we know, the people, our friends, our family, for that people can look at us and say, okay, there's a difference from that guy. He's, he, maybe there's more to him. So uh, yeah. Amen. Awesome. Wow, look at him. He goes, oh, you switched up the game on me. You, you had, look how much he had to say of his own words from those two verses. You guys understand you have that in you if you're doing quiet times and striving to walk with God. There should be no nervousness. We should get to a point on service where we come on Sunday and I, no one prepares the sermon, no one prepares anything, and we sing and we praise and we go, who's going to do communion today? You should be able to come up and give a communion. Contribution, go, I'm fired up to give because I know it goes to save cells. Who wants to preach? What do you want to preach on? Let's just preach. You could open up to any scripture and read the chapter if you're in the spirit and explain it. Now, 
I'm not going overboard what I just said. Yeah. I'm really not. Sometimes I don't like having it too prepared just to purpose. Like sometimes I'll wait to ask the guy to pray and see if he's ready to pray. Because I'm not trying to put him on the spot, but I just I want to help him. If he's not ready, I go, I appreciate being honest. Bro, get, repent. Get open with somebody. I don't want you to get up there praying if you're all send out. And you're not, you, don't have the, you don't have the zeal. This is a church of the living God. So, all right, so, all right, so that was a great job. Um, bro, hate what is evil. You could say, I, I've heard this before. You always want to think, like, hate what is evil. What's that mean? Well, you could use, like, I used to smoke cigarettes. I hate cigarettes now. And I used to pray for God to help me hate them. So now when I'm around them, they make me nauseous. And when I, but before it was like, I was jonesing, right? When I gave them up in 93, but that was one of the things I said, God, help me hate it. Please help me get sick. Help me to be disgusted by it. And as I prayed, it went from going, looking at one, going, I want to smoke to, now I can't, if I get near it, it gets me sick. And I, it's not the person, I just go, I hate them. You know what I mean? Hate what God hates, love what God loves. That's the key. All right, so how about, uh, how about Gary, you want to come up and do one? Come on. You can use this so you can see better. That's all I'm going to do, but I'm going to... Oh, I, I prefer my Bible. Okay, all right. All right, so uh, 1, Peter 1. Go to Peter 1, go, go to chapter Peter 1, and, and why don't you preach on, on verse 3 through um, 3 and 4. Two ver you notice how we're just doing two verses, guys? Because I want people to have time, but you realize how much is packed in it? Sometimes when you do your quiet time, don't... Look for reading quantity, quality, because you want God to move your heart. You want to know God more. So you're wanting to go, what is God saying? And I'm part of this. So why don't you read? Uh, First Peter 1. Yeah, three. First Peter chapter 1, 3. If you want to look at that, you can read 3, three and 4. Okay. All right, here ready? Let's go, Gary. Let us again. First Peter chapter 1. Let me get it right. Yes. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brothers. Uh, on, First come. Peter chapter one, verse three and four. Amen. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and in an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Amen, brothers. You know, God's grace and mercy is so awesome. Um, more than we can imagine. Grace, grace, you know what grace is? It's getting something we don't deserve. You know what mercy is? Not getting what we do deserve. Wow, that's good. You know, we're born again, right? Come on. There's no such thing as a born again Christian. If you're a Christian, you're born again. Yeah. You know, we're, we're saved, all our sins are forgiven, and we get to indwell in the Holy Spirit to live a new life. It's a new birth into a living hope. And it says here our inheritance can never perish, spoil, or fade. Well, it can't, but we can walk away from God. This is really hard, Chris. <laughs> okay, um, you know, we can be secure by our salvation. If we, if we just keep on filling our hearts and minds with God's word, and if we're prayerful, like praying about hate and sin in our lives, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I mean, I can remember as a young disciple praying all the time about hating masturbation, hating sexual impurity, hating pornography. Yeah. And you know, God changed my heart. Yeah. And, and you know what I started doing? I started praying. When I started noticing a woman, I would pray for their soul. I'd catch myself. I'd start praying for their soul. And I'd ask God to make my heart pure. You know, our salvation is more valuable than anything else we could possibly have. I mean, think about it. You know, we're disciples. We can make a difference in this world. You know, it's the greatest adventure being in God's kingdom. There's so much love to experience, so much um, learning and growing. I mean, we get to help people and make a difference in our lives. And after that, we die, we go to heaven. And we, for an eternity with God. It's waiting there for us. You know, we get to, let's just give our whole hearts right now and just appreciate the gift we have here. Amen. And then be with God forever in the end. Amen. Amen. Awesome, Gary. Awesome. Bro, it's not really hard. You, you did awesome. And did you see me at the end? He got excited. We're going to heaven. Yeah. See, he got caught up in it. That's it. 
He realized, well, we are going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. Uh, great job. And I know, guys, first time, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I want you to see and believe that if you're walking with God, even if, and I'm not giving you like textual, where you have to know historical context, but you can really read it and just forget about everybody else. And when you read it out loud, go, what is that saying to me? And then start talking out loud. You'll start saying something because you are a disciple. And all you're doing is don't try to add anything, just break it down. And I can say one more thing, almost in any verse you can look, you can breathe gratitude into it. Because if you look in, 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 in verse 3, you've got to look at the grammar of the uh, chap- uh, verse 3, uh, the first sentence of, of verse 3, it's exclamation point. Is he not fired up and grateful? He's announcing, hey guys, this is amazing, but he's full of gratitude. Look how he says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's an exclamation point. You know he's excited. Why? Thank you, God. Praise God. He's grateful. He's full of grateful because right afterwards, what's he share? Not only with us, he can't contain it. We have an inheritance. I mean, but think about it. That's just gratitude dripping off the plate. You see that? So uh, great job, Gary. Let's uh, let's look at um, Romans 6, 23. And uh, Fred, do you want to come up and do that one? Six twenty-three, and you can, if you can see yours, that's fine. Where? Uh, Romans six twenty-three, one verse, but it's a very powerful statement. But you... Romans chapter six, verse twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-two. 20, 20, 20. <laughs> 20. So the Bible says, "For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life." In Christ Jesus, our Lord. You know, when we look at the word wages, it means something that you work for. You know, uh, some of us here have nine to fives. I have a nine to, I have a 10 to seven. I go to work. I do the job that they pay me to do. And my wages are my paycheck at the end of the week. So here we see that God says that what we earn when we sin is death. So Chris always says, like, it it doesn't take a genius to know that, hey, you're going to die. You know, everybody knows that they're going to die regardless of what they believe in. You know, and this is what we earn because everybody sinned. So it's a wage. It's something that you get. Amen. (laughs) We get we get to die because we sin. You know, but the Bible says, but the gift of God is eternal life. You know, what's great about a gift? You don't have to work for it. You know, I read a Facebook post the other day, and somebody said, you know what? I don't understand why I'm going to Walmart to buy my kid a Christmas gift that's two years old for running around, jumping up and down, spilling food all over the place, or or doing these things that he shouldn't be doing. But you know, that parent loves the child regardless of what they do. So they, they say, you know what? Even though this child doesn't deserve these things that I'm about to get them, I'm going to get it for him anyways because I love him. And that's God telling us, you know what? I know you can't do this without grace. So here, I'm going to give you this gift of eternal life. Even though what you worked for, you deserve death and you deserve to go to hell for it because that's what you earned. You know, uh, God is saying, regardless of what you earned, there is a way to make it back to me. And I'm going to give you this gift. Now, what's great about the scripture is the thing about a gift is you can reject it. You know, so God can give us this gift, but it's up to us whether we accept the gift or not. And the only way that we can accept this gift is by reading the Bible and realizing what Christ Jesus did for us. You know, and so I challenge you, brothers, if, if you're uh, still reading, trying to figure out, like, man, what can I do to, to get this gift from God? It's simple. You don't have to do anything but follow his word. And to God be the glory. Amen. Awesome. Well, uh, he alluded on that. was good, bro. That was good. You know, you are free to choose between these two masters. You can have sin or you can have the gift. You can have eternal life. You're free. We get to choose. You can leave here tonight and go, I'm done. And just go into whatever sins you love the most, you thought you loved, go back into them. 
probably hit the liquor store, most of us, on the way out. There's one probably right down the street. And just get loaded, you know, and just go down, down, down. That's your choice, right? It's a dumb choice. But you have the choice to choose between, between the wages of sin or the gift of eternal life. But you know what? You know what? You are not free to adjust the consequences of your choice. But you're free to make the choice. Isn't that interesting? So it's an amazing choice. Uh, the wages of sin is death. Does that mean, what does that mean? Does that mean physical death? What does that mean? Yeah, spiritual. You're dead. You're dead in your transgressions. And see, what I want you guys to do is when you start studying on your own like this, connect these scriptures together. You should be able to connect like right off. I can go Ephesians 2, 1. Let's go there real quick because I want to show you. We're going to do this more, but I want you to see you guys know more than you know because God's doing it. You just have to believe and read and, and then obey. If you obey, you're going to have zeal. Look in verse 1 of chapter 2. It kind of goes away to sin. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of air, the spirit who is now disobedient and, and those who, uh, who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Dead man walking could be the title of your sermon. Dead man walking. You're dead, but you're, 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 you're not you guys like the zombies. You could be, you're a zombie. You're, 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 you're uh, what's that one? De dead walking? What's it called? Walking dead. Walking dead. You could even use that because it's such a popular show. You can see I know it. Walking dead. The title of the sermon is Walking Dead. Yeah. See how you can get creative with the sermon with people? Because people are walking dead. What do you mean? You're dead. You're, you're alive physically, but you're dead in your sins. The wages of sin is death. It's before you die and face damnation, you're a dead man walking. You don't have the ability to grab that joy and really see the purpose of life except blood, sweat, and tears to try to get your food and make a living. What I want to ask you guys as we get ready to come in for landing is go to this scripture because I hit it on Sunday, but I, uh, I've been thinking about it a lot. It's, uh, it's uh, Exodus 4:24. <coughs> And now, as I started to question myself and talk and, and, and re, in my inner thinking, readdress this scripture and then put myself and ask myself a question I'm going to share with you. I want to see if you can ask yourself that question, because at first it's kind of shocking. At least it was for me. Exodus 4.24 says, at the lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. You see that? Yeah. Now, I did say that Moses was the most humble man on earth. Does anybody know where that scripture is? Okay, where is it? Are you sure? Numbers 12.3? Okay, let's go to Numbers 12.3. Hold your place. Uh, num hold your place, uh, but I want you just to see this because I want to make a point. Numbers 12.3. Thank you, Dean. Numbers 12.3. I didn't have that, and I do want to, I, I should have had that in my notes, but I want us to look at it because I did say he did. It says, now Moses, thank you. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone on, else on the face of the earth. Now, go back to the scripture we just looked at. Okay, he's, he's more humble than any man on the earth, and yet... It says in Exodus 4.24, at the lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zipporah, his wife, took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. I surely, uh, it says, surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At that time, she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. Moses had been raised by Pharaoh for 40 years in the Egyptian palace with false gods. He left at 40 after he killed a Egyptian to defend a Hebrew, and, and, and he was afraid, instead, he was afraid to get in trouble, so he took off, and then he went out and he found a group of people called the Bedouins. That's where he got his wife, Zipporah. And when he was with Zipporah, Zipporah, we already know, after going with Moses, she obviously had a faith in God. But neither one of them had the understanding of being raised up in the Lord, where the Lord said the covenant of circumcision must be done. So even though he didn't know, God was going to kill him because he can't move forward 
in deliberate sin. But grace was there, and Zipporah said, let's take that, you know, she made it happen. So God wasn't saying, I'm going to, but God, you have to understand, see, you don't, we think about God sometimes too much the way we think. God's not a human being. God cannot change his character. You understand me that? He cannot be an old grandpa going, it's okay, it's okay, it's not. No, he cannot allow sin that's not humbly repented for and, 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 and honored with the sacrifice of Christ's blood. That's why if you're not humble and you're not confessing and you're not being willing to say, I, please help me change, please forgive me, you are deliberately making God think about killing you. Now, the question is, I actually read this, I actually believe God's thought about killing me probably many, many times. And I thought, that just sounds weird. But I kept thinking about it, and I believe he was. Because I was in deliberate sin for 30 years. Well, 13 on. 12 on, 10 on, but I was in deliberate sin, not even looking for God, not even thinking about it, believed in God, it was so sinful. God allowed me to stay alive, grace. Yes. But I was not pleasing to him, not one girlfriend, nothing was pleasing to him, because everything had sin in it. Yeah. So after I became a disciple and I'm saved by grace, and I'm in the blood of Jesus, if I'm in sin and I deliberately, and there's been times where I've been stuck, I really believe God could have thought about killing me, but because of his great mercy, and Gary said that, great mercy. What was your saying about that, bro? Great mercy is what? Mercy is not getting what, mercy is not getting what you deserve. Yeah, not getting what you deserve. And see, because that's why you see in other people, that's why, that's why Peter goes, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy. Because he thinks about, he, he could kill any one of us. See, if he thought about killing Moses, who's the most humble man on earth, but didn't because of grace, and, he, and I believe he knew Zephora, you know, but, but ignorance doesn't excuse it. You see what I'm saying? Now, they took action, their hearts proved righteous, and nothing happened. But it, why does it allow us to see what God's thinking? That's pretty powerful. It says, it says the Lord was about to kill Moses. It lets us know that he was gonna make him, he was gonna take him out. You, we could all go in our sentimentality, wait a minute, Moses has done so much. Yeah. He's taking a lot of heat for you, sir, big time. That's where you got to disconnect this emotional mumbo, fakeness, doctrine stuff and realize God is God and you are not. And you've got to work on getting the fear of God because some of you are too slow to change. You take your time. You just think God is up there sleeping, taking his grandpa a nap, not paying. No, you, you, you have great patience and, and mercy. And don't get me wrong, but you've got to give your whole heart. What's the greatest commandment? Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. That doesn't even talk about being evil. That's not raping, killing, stealing, lying, having sex. That's just not putting him first and loving him with everything. And then he says, whatever you do, do it as though you're doing it for the Lord. So you're going to be honest in everything. Now, we're going to fall short, and he's patient, but you got to realize, look at that. That scripture doesn't even look like it fits in the Bible. It's kind of weird, isn't it? The Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. I mean, I'm reading it. And he loved Moses. But you understand, God loves his righteousness more than his people. Now, that might not make sense humanistically, but he calls us to be righteous and pure. He's invited us into inheritance of heaven that we, me and myself, can't, can't comprehend of the level of purity that we're going to be involved in and in righteousness. We don't even get it. We can't. He says he lives in an approachable light right now. So God's not saying, hey, I'm going to be mean. It's all about your heart. Are you willing to quickly repent? Are you willing to go, I need help, God? Are you willing? It doesn't even mean you have to be able to do it great. You just got to go, I, I, I admit I'm wrong and I want help. God's like, wow, that's awesome. So see, it's not really a mean God. It's really we are the ones. Because once Moses was exposed, even though he didn't know that you're supposed to, he, or he was so distracted or whatever, he still needed to get right. And they did it. The wages of sin are death. God's thought about killing all of us, but he didn't because of his great mercy. And he, and he waits and he's patient and he's patient with a lot of people out there in the world. 
that are still sitting up. God is so patient, but you don't want to, you don't want to lean on that side and edge your bets on that. That's a wrong heart. You don't want to just say his grace is so big and that lets you get a little lazy. You don't do that. That's taking advantage. You deal with sin. You have a subconscious awareness of God. You love God. Even though you don't see him, you love him. Even though you don't see him now, you believe in him and you're filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Why? Because you're receiving something you don't deserve or I don't deserve either. The salvation of our souls, the goal of our faith in the blood of Jesus. That has to be a continuous sacrifice because we never can live up to it. But if we're willing with our hearts, God's going, you're awesome. So if you can say that, it may make you more attentive and realize how serious this is. You don't earn it. But are you really striving to love God more than any human being you've ever known? That's hard to do because it's a, he's not a human being. <laughs> it's prayer. But, you know, if he thought about, if he was going to kill Moses, believe me, I don't think any of us were more humble than Moses. It actually says it. So when I say that, it makes me more grateful for God, because I, it makes, but it also makes me more in fear and reverence of the Lord. The beginning of all wisdom and knowledge is the fear of the Lord. Now think about that when you start to masturbate next time. Or look at porno. Or do anything that makes you, causes you to go into sin. Think about that, because he's thinking about killing you, and he'll probably still forgive you. Because I'm not God and I'm not going to tell you mercy. But I'm telling you that to get a healthy fear that if you sin, be going, praise be to the Lord and God and Father. Because of his great mercy, you should be saying that every day when you, when you know you've sinned and you get forgiven. That's how excited you should be to be able to repent. Because it's amazing that he forgives me every day. Isn't that amazing? That's what you got to see how loving God is. He could take us out, but he doesn't because he goes, oh, I want you to make it. That's why my son died. But if you can get that conviction that it's so amazing to be with God, then maybe you'll start coughing up some of the sins that you have pets that you haven't been dealing with because you don't have the right perspective of the biblical God that bind in the Bible. I'm just throwing that out there, laying on your feet. I've been there. I'm not going back. And that's why I want to fire everybody up and I want them to fire me up because we got to all stay fired up. Right? So, repent quickly. Call it, let's call it, let's make a new term in here. Lightning repentance. How about that? Let's shoot for lightning repentance. When you're in sin and you're called out by a brother or someone says something and, and just, just forget about anything else but go, is there truth to it? Own it. Don't go, who are you, dude? Just own it. Go, Ugh. And if you start to get mad or angry, then own that, too, because you're prideful and defensive and being mad that you're called out. Now, remember, David read great patience, careful instruction. Nick came in about 10 minutes late today. He came up and said, I had him doing the welcome. And he said, hey, bro, how you doing? Is, 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 is you still want me to do the welcome? I said, why were you late? He goes, oh, I didn't think it was going to take that much time. And I said, yeah, you can still do the welcome because you don't have a, pair, a pattern of being a derelict. Didn't I say that? <laughs> yeah, I was, I was that's great patience and careful mercy. I'm, that's the way I'm gonna, I want to be treated like God treats me. I don't continuously sin, but I'm going to need mercy. But I don't want to just continually do the same stuff. So I said, no problem, go. Because Nick is normally, it's, it, it's not characteristic. Now, if someone's always late, I'm going to go, there's a problem. I don't know quite what it is, but there's a lack of healthy respect. You're lazy. You're going to hurt your whole life. Because if you're late for God, then what could be more important than that? So I want to help you because I understand that. I was late a lot too. I still have to fight that, but let's not get patterns. So let's close out with 1 Thessalonians 4. You guys, uh, you know, and ask yourself, it's really daunting when you say it to yourself like, God, you've thought about killing me, I bet. That just doesn't sound like Christianity, but it's in the Bible. He doesn't want to. But he cannot allow unforgiven sin to stand before him and you and you keep walking with him. He can't do it. And he's still patient, but you realize you're trampling the Son of God if you don't get radical. So in first, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I, I meant first Thessalonians, apologize. First Thessalonians. So now we're going to, so I'm going to, we're going to leave with an encouragement. Ready? Now, um, who wants to come up and end this? Bryce, come on up. Let's go, Bryce. 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 Let's go, Bryce.
Okay, so you can read these three. And bro, don't, you've never read it before, so don't worry about it. Uh, <clears throat> no, why don't you read, read? Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 through 18. Just forget about everybody else and read it and then re-break it down what it's saying to us. 16 through 18. Yeah, yeah. so it's 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. And uh, this is very encouraging because it even says that. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Um, it, it, for me, reading has changed a little bit because I had to really start to believe what I was reading. Come on. Um, I think that's why there's a lot of people who can have gr like a whole plethora of knowledge of the Bible back and forth and be atheists because they don't believe it. But when you have that little bit of faith, when you read it and you hear that for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command. Like I just sit there and think all of a sudden everybody who had that faith is going to be sitting there and then God's going to come down with the trumpet and the call of God. Who knows what that's going to sound like? I imagine. Yeah. Boom! You know what I mean? Something loud. Something. And everybody's going to sit there and everybody's going to be Terrified. I think even people who are saved are going to be terrified until you realize what it was. And then you're going to be ecstatic. Because yeah. everybody's going to have to sit there and be like, we know it! We know it! We know it! Yes! You know what I mean? That's what I'm going to be like. I'm going to be like, Shh. but for the people who weren't saved, that's going to be terrifying. Because I can only imagine they're going to fall down and try, I mean... Probably the same, same thing that happens to people. I was on a plane actually when I was coming back and uh, we were going through a storm and we hit turbulence. And uh, we had a guy who sat down next to me, you know, he was real tough looking dude. And he looked at me, I looked at him. You know, plane took off, <laughs> plane took off, right? And we hit a bump that dropped us. And I looked over at him and he looked over at me and then it lifted us up and we dropped and I, for three seconds, I know my, I know we were both just like, all right, this is it, this is it. For me, for me, I was like, you know what, this is it, this is it, you know? Like, I've been getting myself right. Like, if this is how I gotta meet God, hey. Yeah. How are you, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so, it says after that, we who are still alive, and our left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encouraging is a, is a big thing that I haven't done my part of enough. Um, it's probably one of the most important things because that's what really keeps us He's just faithful in a way, is the fact that we can sit there and be able to talk to each other and be able to do that. So to me, this just means like well, midweeks and church, as much as we can come together, the importance of that is, is pretty, pretty clear. Amen. Awesome. It's not bad. Good job. Let's listen. Let's listen. Now, 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 everybody did a great job. What I want you to do is allow yourself to trust God more when you do that. And when you read on your own, get as excited as Bryce did. You see when Bryce got up, he never read that, but he didn't plan to go, boom! He didn't plan to go, whoa! And then, he, then, then that story, I don't think you had, you didn't have that plan, but then it came to him. 
which tied in about it just so happens. So you can tie things in. Everybody has experiences, but that was a great tie in. And we've all been in turbans, and sometimes I have been in turbans, so I go, like, I felt that. Not every time, but sometimes I've had that, and I'm like, oh my gosh, is the guy going to be able to take care of the plane? But that was a perfect tie-in, and every one of you, you don't, have to, you don't compare, but you have little analogies. And then he was humble. He says, I need to work more on encouragement, but he was funny. He didn't plan that. He was real, and we're leaving here encouraged right now, because even the Bible says encourage one another. It is awesome to be walking in the presence of God and knowing it. So guys, let's have a prayer and let's go out filled with inexpressible and glorious joy and include that prayer, that verse Peter 8 and 9.